So in this lecture, we're going to talk about conditionals. And we've alluded to conditionals in some of our classwork because at some point, it really becomes almost impossible to not use conditionals. They are a really, really basic concept in programming and extremely valuable and useful. So if we've got functions that do work on data and variables that are containers for data, then a conditional allows you to make questions and make, ask questions, I should say, and make assertions about data. So let's talk about what this means and how we can use it. Welcome to our lecture on conditionals. We've talked about this a little bit. We've sort of danced around it in some of our labs when we actually used a conditional and it's like, oh my gosh, I haven't told you what this means yet. Uh, that's, that's always a danger in programming, especially with basic concepts, is you need to learn a lot of different techniques and thankfully they're all pretty simple before you can actually start making complicated programs. The nice thing about conditionals though is that they're pretty straightforward and they're pretty easy to use. So we've talked about variables being containers for data, we've talked about functions doing work on data, and we've talked about object-oriented programming. And a conditional is the next step. So a conditional allows you to ask questions and make assertions about data. So let's take a look at how this works. In C Sharp, there are several different kinds of conditionals, and we'll talk about all of them in this lecture. But the most widely used and the one that people recognize most readily from other classes is the if statement. So let's take a look at an if statement. Now I'm using something called pseudocode in this example. This isn't real code that will compile. It's just designed to be simple and easy to read so you can see the structure of what I'm talking about. So what we have is an if statement which begins with the if keyword and you can tell that it is actually a built-in function because it has parentheses following it. This follows for pretty much anything with parentheses after it. If there's a parenthesis, then it is a method. And in this case, it's a built-in method. It's part of the language. So the if keyword is then, conf is then followed by a parenthesis, a set of parentheses containing some condition. And that condition has to evaluate to either true or false, which would make an excellent test question, by the way. Has to evaluate to either true or false. So whatever goes in this condition block, this condition statement, is going to be a Boolean value of some kind. And it can either be directly a Boolean, you can test to see whether or not a Boolean value is true or false, or you can put a statement in there that evaluates to true or false. The conditional statements are followed by curly braces, and then after that you have a code block. And that code block will execute if the statement in the condition block is true. So the curly braces are in red, the code block is in blue, and of course, again, this is pseudocode. You could have one or more lines of C-sharp code in there. But the code that would be in the blue block would only execute if the condition evaluates to true. For example, if we have an if statement that looks like this, we can say if score is greater than 1,000, then set level to 5. And so this is only going to run if score, some score variable somewhere in our program, is greater than 1,000. And as soon as that happens, then we're going to run source, some sort of method that we've created called set level, and we're going to pass in a 5. And it could be anything. You could run anything in that code block, but the 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 key to remember here is the conditional part of the if statement. So we're evaluating to see whether or not it's true. And I want to go ahead and point something out, and that is we've mentioned that there's a semicolon at the end of every line in C-sharp except when there's not. And it, it's one of those unfortunate rules in the language that you just have to learn with experience. So here's an example of one of those exceptions to the rule. You can see we have at the end of the set level statement, we have our semicolon, but the end of the if statement doesn't have one. And that's because it's closed off by a curly brace. So if there's a curly brace there, there's no need to put a semicolon at the end of an if statement. Okay, so when you're doing your conditional statements, you need to be able to use these things called comparison operators. And you'll recognize them. There's one that looks a little strange, and there's one you've never seen before, probably, 
but the rest of them you will be comfortable with. These allow you to make some sort of comparison and determine whether or not a condition is true or false. So greater than, less than, greater than, equal to, less than or equal to, these are all common things that you've learned in your math classes over the years. The last two are a little less common. The first one is a comparison operator that determines whether or not two things are equal. And you'll notice that there are two equal signs together, not just one. A single equal sign is called an assignment operator. And assignment operators, as the name implies, are used to assign a value rather than compare it. So when you have two equal signs together, you're doing a comparison. When you have one equal sign, you are talking about an assignment. And if you tried to put an assignment operator, a single equal sign, inside that if statement, it would actually flag it as an error because what would happen if it didn't do that is the condition would always be true because the result of an assignment is always true. So that wouldn't really help you. So C Sharp has gotten smart enough over the years that it flags that as an exception and won't allow you to compile. And then the last one is the not operator. And you'll see this used in conjunction with some of the other ones. So not by itself or not equals is completely valid. So you're just looking for the opposite to be true. It's kind of like opposite day when we were kids. Okay, so we've got an if statement. It would follow then that we have an else statement as well. So in this, in this case, what happens is if the condition is true, the red statement will execute. And if the statement is not true, then the blue one will execute. And so you have an if statement that you can tack on to the end of your statements to handle the other case. So it's either true or false, only two cases are possible. And you can use the else statement to sort of round that out if you need to do something different in the event that your statement is not going to be true. Next, let's talk about compound conditionals. So compound conditionals allow you to test for multiple conditions at the same time, and you can combine your evaluations using additional logical operators. So let's take a look at what this looks like. Let's do it in English first. Let's test two conditions. We'll say if condition A or condition B, note that it's an or. So this means if either one of these things are true, then we're going to execute the code block. But in code, we don't use the word or. We use these pipe symbols. They're called pipes. This is a key that is on your keyboard that you may not even have known was there. It's right above the inner key, and it's the shifted backslash. And it's odd because on the keyboard, it looks like some sort of funny colon. It looks like two symbols with a separation in them. But when you type it, it just looks like a long bar, and it's called a pipe. All right, so this is just the statement rewritten in code. We've changed the word or to these two pipes. And you want to make sure that you use two of them. This is a comparative or. If you do one pipe, then it's going to be a logical or, and it means something else. So be careful that you always put two in there. So if that's or, it would make sense that we would need a way to also do and. And is the same thing, except it's two ampersand signs. Remember again to use two and not one, because one ampersand would mean something else, which isn't what you wanted. Okay, so let's look at an example. If we expand on our earlier statement, we're saying if a score, some variable called score is greater than 1,000 and it's also less than 5,000, then we're going to set the level to 2, or whatever happens there is up to you. You could put any code in the code block that you want to. Again, the key takeaway here is, is that code is only going to execute if both of those conditions are true. If we had put an OR statement in here, it would execute if either of them were true. So just be careful that you realize which one you're using and act accordingly. All right, so we've got this construct where we can do two conditions, an IF and an ELSE, a true and a false. But the world is not always black and white, is it? So how do we do something a little more complicated? Well, we have a way to do that, and it's with a statement called else if. So take a look at this one. Now I realize that this is um, not exactly really well written. What I wanted to show you was a structure that had an if and else if in it, and then finally an else. 
So in this case, we've written this method and it takes an integer called value and we're detecting whether or not that value is zero. And then if it isn't, then we're gonna go ahead and detect if it's less than or equal to 10. And then if that's not true, then we're gonna detect whether or not it's less than or equal to 100. And if none of those conditions are true, then we're gonna follow through to our else statement and we're just gonna return two. Now I say it's not very well written because I normally would not use return statements in the block of the else statement like this. As a personal rule, I prefer to use one return statement at the end and to set variables in between. The problem with putting these return statements in here is that you're, you have multiple exit points from your method and that can sometimes be a little bit error prone, a little bit hard to find when you're debugging. So that's just my personal style. There's nothing technically wrong with this, um, but I don't like it. So I thought I would point that out. All right, so we've got these if and else if statements, and these can actually get kind of hairy, kind of long and drawn out. So there's another way I want to show you to do conditionals in C Sharp, and that's with a construct called switch statements. So consider something along these lines. Let's say you had a number of if statements that are sort of stacked on top of each other. And again, this is not the best example in the world because it, you can actually, if you stare at this long enough, you can refactor it down to two or three lines of code. But I wanted to show you a case where we've got three if statements stacked on top of each other and how you can actually make this a little bit cleaner, a little bit more readable by using a switch statement, which looks like this. Now, don't let the length the change in the length fool you. I mentioned I could have refactored the previous example to be as short as this one is. It's uh, what we really want to focus on in this case is the difference in the syntax. There's no if statement in here at all. Instead, we use the switch statement and switches are designed to make this a lot more readable and a lot more easy to maintain. So what we have here is the switch statement. Now let's take a look at the, the anatomy of a switch statement so that you know what all the parts for it are and how they work. So we start with the switch keyword. That's just a, a keyword that's built into the language. And then it's a, a method, not unlike if is also a method. It has parentheses after it. So that's how we know it's a method. And it's taking a single argument. In this case, arbitrarily, I've used the letter i as a variable. And then based on the value of i, then we're going to evaluate these various cases. Now, one thing I want to point out, especially to those of you coming from a C or C++ background, is that in C Sharp, you are not limited to, be, to using integers. And I think Java has this limitation as well. You're not limited to just using integers in your switch. You can use strings as well. In fact, I think you can use pretty much any type in there, but the ones that you're going to see most often are going to be strings and integers. It's really hard to use floats in there because floats are not precise. So you're probably not going to see a float in, an, in a switch statement because it would be impossible to get the level of precision what required to have it reliably trigger. So be careful with floats, but I think everything else is fair game, though I'm pretty sure that you're mostly going to be using ints and strings. All right, so let's go take a look at the rest of how the the rest of this code and see how the rest of this works so for each one you have this case and this is the equivalent to saying we're saying case zero here it's case followed by the value and what we're really saying here is if i is equal to zero then we're going to execute the code block that comes after it now i've got one statement here there could be multiple statements here and that would be fine whatever code runs here is going to run because i is equal to zero and then after that we have something called a break statement so a break statement is actually pretty pretty interesting and something that i really want to draw attention to because it is the source of a lot of programmer pain and suffering if they do this incorrectly so a break statement actually stops the evaluation and exits the switch which is usually what you want this goes back to an analogy that i mentioned in a classroom lecture where if you have lost your keys and you're looking for them, as soon as you find them, you stop looking for them, right? There's no point if there are nine places where they could be and you found it in the third place. There's no sense looking in the fourth place because you've already found what you were looking for. Same thing is true here as you're going through these case statements. Once you find a match, 
there really is no point in evaluating the remainder of possibilities. And so the break statement allows you to basically say, hey, I found what I was looking for. Let's exit the switch statement and move on with life and go on with the next statement. So that's what they're for. Now let me show you the mistake that can be sometimes made. And this is actually legal syntax. There's technically nothing wrong with this. But what if we had a situation where the break is missing? In this case, uh, if I were equal to four, it would set retval to true, and then it would continue on to case five and continue attempting to figure out what the value should be on retval. And there's probably no good reason for that to happen. Now there is a legitimate case for doing this fall through stuff. I don't like it, I don't use it, but I'll tell you that it exists, people use it. And so what it would look like would be if I had taken out the two lines beneath case four and basically stacked case four on top of case five. And in that case, what we would have, no pun intended, would be the same as if I had said, if I equals four or five, then it would fall through and go ahead and evaluate true in that condition. I personally just prefer to have all of them be explicit and then break out whenever I need to. So the two lines of code that we're saving aren't really worth it with respect to the kinds of problems that you can see if you use these fall through conditions. So one thing I want to point out is there is actually a test question in one of your tests where fall through is there and the answer is that it's it's a fall through condition it's not that I'm being cute and showing you fall through and it's cool it's actually bad I think it's so bad that you should be careful with it and I think it's bad enough to make a test question out of it so while you could make the argument that there's nothing wrong with the code I'm telling you there is something wrong with the code and you should go ahead and take care of that break condition and if you disagree with me then feel free to disagree with me after the test uh, that's always my advice to unruly professors like me. If you want to call me a professor, I don't call me a professor, but if you want to call me a professor, I guess that's technically okay. Um, kind of, you kind of have to do it the way they tell you to do it and then, you know, go off and do it your own way later. So that's my advice. Um, go ahead and answer the question as I expect it. And then that will make your life a little bit easier. And then after you get your A, then you can come back and say, well, that Van Horn guy, whatever. Okay, so you see what I'm saying. Just um, go ahead and answer the question in that manner. And I am hopefully then teaching you a good habit versus, you know, what you can do isn't always what you should do. All right, so let's go on with our anatomy example on our switch statement. So the next thing I want to show you is the default statement or the default end block of a switch statement. So basically you can probably figure out what this does. It runs if none of the other conditions are satisfied. Now you don't have to put that in there. If you want it to if you want to set this up so that if none of the switches match then nothing happens. That's very legitimate. That happens all the time. You don't have to put a default at the end. And so just leave that part out. But if you do, then it's going to catch anything, in this case, that isn't 0, 1, 2, or 3. Anything else is going to set retval equal to 4, 5, 6, 7. And you would think that you wouldn't need it, but you do have to have a break statement after default. You would think, well, it's the last thing. There's nothing to fall through to, and so why do I need a break statement? Well, C Sharp says you need it, and it won't compile if you don't put it in. Okay, so that's the end of the switch statement. We're going to see these in our labs most certainly as we move through the course. And let's move on to one more really, really important topic with respect to conditionals, and that is the try-catch finally statement. So this is how you detect and react to errors that happen in your code. Now, I'm not talking about syntax errors that occur. If you type something in wrong and it won't compile, I'm talking about runtime errors that occur when you do things that are particularly risky in some way. And since it's risky, I, I always think of the uh, the Pink song where she says, um, if it burns, it doesn't mean you're going to die, and then you got to get up and try. And tr you're welcome for me not singing it, by the way. That was my gift to you for this lecture, is me not singing. So let's take a look at what a try statement does. 
Basically, it allows you to attempt a, a block of code where you expect a possible error. And these are going to be things that are beyond your control most of the time. For example, if you connect to a database, maybe the database isn't up. This is a, a server that we're talking about. And servers sometimes fail, routers fail, network cards fail. There are a lot of points of failure when you're trying to connect to a database. Likewise, anything with the internet is risky. So the internet can go up, the internet can go down, things can time out. There's all kinds of things that can go wrong if you're trying to pull something from the internet. There are plenty of classes in Unity and in C Sharp where logic is outside of your control. Maybe you're even using a third party plugin or something like that. And there are things that are beyond your control. So if it is in any way risky, then you usually want to use a try catch in order to try to account for things that you weren't expecting. And likewise, those pesky users can sometimes do things that we were not expecting. So you really want to sort of be careful with your code and make sure that you catch these kinds of exceptions as they occur so that you can deal with them gracefully rather than just crashing your program. As before, let's take a look at the anatomy of a try statement. So we're going to start off with, again, the obvious first part, which is the try keyword. And the try keyword is always going to be followed by these curly braces, like so many other things in our code will be. And then what we do is we try some, some piece of code that is inherently risky. For example, again, connecting to something or maybe, you know, allowing the user to type whatever they want in there when you're really looking for something really specific, anything that might cause any sort of error. And then there's the catch statement. So the, the part that you're trying goes in the first block, and then the second block is devoted to what you think might happen and what you're going to do about it. So the catch statement usually has a couple of things that go with it. The catch statement is followed by whatever exception you think is going to occur. And in this case, I've used the exception class, which is the top level base class for all other exceptions, which means any exception that occurs is going to be captured and stored in a variable called ex. And that's handy later on as we learn about debugging and logging and things like that, where we can actually go back and see what the error is because we've captured it and put it into a variable. And then after that, you just handle the error. Now, it is possible to catch specific things and react to various errors differently. For example, if we were doing some sort of file operation, we might decide that we wanted to see what, what happened if we caught an I.O. exception, which is basically only fired when you have some sort of input-output exception. A great example of this is if the user tries to save a file to a location that they don't have permissions on the folder. So if they, they don't have permissions to access the folder, they can't save a file there. However, in most cases that I'm aware of, uh, Windows will still show you, and for that matter, so will the other operating systems. The other operating systems will show you that file. They will allow you to select it. And so that's a great condition where an error might happen that you can't account for in your code, or, you, or, or that you are accounting for it in your code by using these try statements. So you can catch individual exceptions by name and by type, and you can also capture multiples at the same time. For example, we could catch our I.O. exception again, and then we could just add a regular exception below that. So this will catch anything that's an I.O. exception. We'll run the code that says handle the I.O. error, and then any other exception that's caught will, will basically be caught by the second catch, and whatever code you put in there will deal with any, other, any error that isn't an I.O. error. There is a variant of this that will allow you to catch everything, and that's called just a catch without the arguments on it. I generally think this is a bad idea. It, it's done, but I think it's bad because you can't see what the problem is. And you can at least react to it, though, so that's better than the next condition I'll show you. Uh, but usually you're going to wind up putting the exception argument in here so you can at least attach debuggers to this and see what the exception is and see what the problem is and hopefully fix it. But what's worse than a catch that catches everything is something we call 
a swallowed exception. So a swallowed exception looks like this. Let's say that we're gonna do something risky. In this case, I'm using some C-sharp code to download an image called mobiusduck.ping, and I'm gonna save that to the temp folder on my C drive and call it thunderduckping. And that there are a lot of things that can go wrong with that. So what if I don't have a good internet connection what if I can't write to the temp folder? Maybe the temp folder doesn't even exist on this computer. Maybe it exists and I don't have access to it. Um, in this case, I'm doing catch, and then I'm literally putting the commented code in there that says do nothing, and that's literally what you would see in production code. And this is what we mean by a swallowing the exception. You're never going to see the exception. There's never going to be any code that does anything with the exception. They, the programmer literally puts two com puts a commented statement in here, two slashes, and then whatever after it. And that's the end of it. And this is a really, really bad practice. Um, this allows exceptions to occur in your program, and there's no way for you to know that they're there. So as Master Yoda once said, um, and I know that we remember this quote, he's, he basically said that laziness is the path to the dark side. Laziness leads to swallowed exceptions, and swallowed exceptions lead to suffering. Well, that may not exactly be what he said, but it was close. And if he knew what a swallowed exception was, he certainly would have said this. So usually that's the problem with the swallowed exceptions is laziness. Or if it's not laziness, then it's being rushed. And those are kind of almost the same problem. You're not taking the time to do everything that you could do to make a quality piece of software. So what could you do instead and these are a little advanced, probably a little ahead of our lecture series, but I'm going to put them out there anyway so that you can be thinking about them. You can log whatever message that the exception throws, and maybe if, if you want to go a whole hog, and you probably should do this, you can go ahead and log the stack trace as well. You've probably made a mistake at some point in your labs that led you to a stack trace, and that basically is a list of every call that's been made that led to the exception, and it allows you to really trace back to the origin of the problem. And that's a good piece of information for you to have. So if this exception is occurring on a computer that isn't your development station, maybe it's on a server or on a user's computer or a tester's computer, then you can actually see what the exception is without necessarily being able to attach a debugger to that machine. You can send the exceptions via email. I use a web framework in Python called Flask where this is the default behavior. So if anything bad happens, I get an email that says, hey, something bad happened and here's where it was and here's the message and here's what happened. And that's pretty cool. Likewise, you could do the same thing with HipChat, which is a sort of a really nice, I don't mean to, to put plugs in here. There are a couple of plugs on this page and they're not really intentional. I've been endorsing any of these things, but I use HipChat. It's a sort of a, a, uh, oh, what do you call it? Text, it's not text messaging, it's a chat system. The thing about this chat system, though, is it's closed. So when you sign up for HitChat, you sign up as a company or you can sign up as a team, and it's it costs money. It's a dollar or something. It's, it's not very expensive. It's a couple of dollars a month. And um, the nice thing about that is it it's not really social media. You're not going to get friend requests from people you've never heard of before, maybe overseas wanting you to help them move money from Nigeria to the United States. You're not going to get any of that because I think partially because it's paid and partially because it's they sort of vet who goes on there. So this is something that you can use as a project team. And one of the things that I do in my programs is I have uh, my programs have their own chat ID so the programs can chat to you. And that's nice because it makes it possible not only for them to send messages to you, but you can also send messages to your programs and give them remote commands and tell them to do things. So it's kind of a cool setup. And you don't have to manage the infrastructure for the messaging. So that's, that's a good idea, I think. Uh, there are a number of services out there, and they're actually pro proliferating at an alarming rate. Uh, these are error trapping and reporting services and the one that immediately comes to mind is raygun.io. I've never actually used raygun.io, but I've been through sort of their marketing pitch and their training materials, and it looks pretty cool. I just haven't used it. So I can't really endorse it, but I can tell you that there are lots and lots and lots of these things out there that do the same sorts of things that raygun.io does. And a lot of this is because of, again, the proliferation of mobile devices. So we have all these devices out there. It's it's a little hard to get 
a log message off of somebody's iPad or somebody's iPhone or an Android device somewhere. And so these sort of remote reporting tools are becoming more popular and more interesting. And another thing that I've done in the past is um, I have a ticketing system. I personally use Jira, and I think it's really good. So the, I guess that is a program plug. Um, but you could use anything else. You could use Bug Track. You could use Fog Bugs, whatever you like. And there are lots of those out there as well. But you can have your code automatically set up an issue in Jira if it fails. And I've done that on various projects before as well. You can, a couple of different ways to do that. So those are all things that you could do instead of swallowing the exception. Uh, some of them are, are very easy and straightforward things you should be doing anyway. You should probably have some sort of logging system in your program if, if you're expecting any kind of problems. Um, even in games, it's probably not a bad idea to log things. And it, even in games, it's probably a great idea to be tracking things anyway because you want sort of the ability to capture your how your users are playing your game so that you can go back and analyze what they do and hopefully make better games next time. So these kinds of reporting infrastructures are not going to be foreign even in the gaming industry. And you should take advantage of them not only for recording user feedback and recording user interactions, but also for tracking exceptions. Okay, so finally, let's talk about the finally clause. I, I've been dying to say that for the entire lecture. The finally clause. So this is what rounds out our try-catch little section of code here. What you can do with a finally clause, a finally clause goes at the end, and it basically runs no matter what. So let me show you what that looks like. So we have try and then catch. So that's where the error handling goes. And then we have this finally statement. The finally statement or the finally block of code is going to run regardless of whether or not there was an error. So it'll go from try. If everything's fine, it'll go from try to finally. And if there was a mistake, it'll go from try to catch to finally. So finally always runs. Just remember that. That's important. This is useful for cleaning things up. So let's say you open a connection to the internet. You try to pull some files down. There's an exception. The finally clause allows you to close your connection to the internet. So you want to do that regardless because you probably did that in the try block. You opened it, something bad happened, it finally lets you clean up after whatever you did in try that might need to be cleaned up. And then I'll point out that you can actually create a try finally statement with no catch in it. So this happens from time to time, and I'm not going to say it's bad, because I've actually used it a number of times where it was warranted. I wanted to try, and um, and then, you know, I wasn't necessarily interested in doing anything with the exception. It's like, well, if this doesn't work, then I just want to go do this and call it a day. Um, it wasn't a, a, a situation where I needed to log and find the exception. I literally was just, well, let's just do this. If, if something else, if something happens, then we're going to do this. And so there's... Um, there's the finally clause by itself. Okay, so to really wrap up the try-catch stuff, the try-catch finally stuff, I guess I should say, um, you have to have either a catch or a finally after your try. Um, either or, or both. But you have to have one or the other. You can't have a try statement by itself. So that pretty much wraps up conditionals and how we sort of do logic in programming. It's one of the most important parts of programming. And um, so we have the ability to do work on data, but now we actually have the, the ability to ask questions about data. And you really can't do work without the ability to ask those kinds of questions. So these are, ver are fairly simple constructs, easy to understand, I hope. And so now we're ready to move on to the fifth element which I think is a movie. And uh, that's going to be talking about, well, I can't remember if it's collect. It's probably collections. It's either collections or loops. I'm pretty sure it's collections, though. So we'll talk about that next.